about to say, I was going to ask you to remind me to remind you in case I forget to remind you. Two way. Two there way. you go. You remembered. Okay, I'm going to also mute everyone. <clears throat> Okay, amazing. All right, my friends, welcome. Uh, Tuesday night Parsha class. I hope everybody's well. I hope you've had a, uh, a healthy week, a week full of bracha. Um, we continue to daven, we continue to pray in all the way, manners that we do for the safety of uh, all Jews in the world, but particularly, of course, our brothers and sisters in Israel. We pray for the safe return of the hostages as quickly as possible. It's hard to imagine. The, um, what they're going through physically, emotionally, it's it's difficult psychologically. And we pray that Hashem finds a way to bring them back home to their families uh, in peace. And may the merit of our collective Torah study serve as a merit for them, for everybody who needs a foolish lame, for everybody who needs a Yeshua. So let's begin with um, this week's parasha, which of course is parasha Mishpatim. Um, Mishpatim literally means ordinances, and as we know through various parts of the Torah, there are mitzvot in the Torah, which the English version of or precepts or commandments, but the commandments fall into categories, meaning not all commandments are alike. We've seen examples of commandments which are part of the obligations that Jews have, but we don't know the reason for them. So, for example, we talked about the Parad Numa, the ashes of the red heifer which in the time of the temple had the ritual ability to purify somebody who became impure through contact with a dead body. But why that works, we have no clue. We don't know why kashru is a, a mitzvah. Uh, there are lots of theories of people saying it over the ages, but the truth of the matter is the Torah never reveals to us why he wants us not to eat pork. No idea. Why are shellfish not kosher? There is no revealed answer. There is an answer in God's mind, but we don't know what that is. So those are called hukim. And then there are lots of laws that are connected to our, our, as it were, making a statement about God's presence in the universe. So, for example, so many of the laws of Shabbat. What, what's Shabbat? It's the day of rest, of course. There's a lot of prohibitions, what you can do, what you can't do. But what lies at the core of Shabbat is a statement on our part, a declaration on our part, that God created the universe and he is the ultimate creator. That series of mitzvot are called edot, which are from the common word a which is testimony. So our observance of these mitzvot serve as a practical declaration of our testimony to God's sovereignty over the world. And then there's a category of mitzvot, which the translation in the I'm reading from right now from the art school is ordinances. Um, and ordinances, or mishpatim, as is the name of the parsha are those sorts of mitzvot that um, one could argue make sense because they are laws and regulations that govern human social um, life. So all of the things in this parsha, you could say, sort of like make sense because they fall into this broad category of civil law. So parashat mishpatim, which I think has 43 Mit, mishpatim, that's 43 separate mitzvot, all of this nature that have to do with the way in which we structure our society and in which way we govern ourselves in our society. So as we begin, I want to first acknowledge the generous sponsorship of tonight's shear. Thank you, Kenny and Sherry Wise, who are sponsoring tonight's shear in memory uh, of the, in, in honor of commemoration of the yurt site of Kenny's father, Harry Wise, Zihomo Livaha. May his neshama have an aliyah, and can may you and Sherry and your whole family be blessed with long life and good health. So, I wanted to start tonight's shear from the very beginning. And in fact, what I want to do is spend a little bit of time, not even on the first pasuk, although we are beginning there, even the first letter. So I want to read the first pasuk, read the first in Hebrew, English. As we, as we know, you don't have to have a humash in front of you. If you don't want to, you certainly... Welcome to do so. That's it. That is the whole first pursuit. Five words. I'm going to read from the Arts Arts Scroll interpretation. 
and these are the ordinances, we discussed those, that you shall place before them. Now, I want to just take a look at the difference between two words. The first word of our parsha is ve ele, which is translated as and, and these, and these ve ele, or the word ele, which is just these. Ve ele and these, or ele these. And Rashi is mindful of that vav, that single letter, that conjunctive letter vav, whose translation, as I just uh, read to you, is an. And. And these are the ordinances. Now, could this pasu, could this verse have begun without the word an? These are the ordinances that you should place with it before them. Eile hamishvatim. These are the audience, ordinances. Yeah, it does make sense. So again, through the traditional rabbinical lens of biblical interpretation, even one single letter that need not be written and is written is a red <clears throat> sign, stop, and figure out the answer why. So it's not surprising that Holy Rashi, one of the, the most important of all commentaries to the Torah, begins by telling us that don't skip over that vav. It's there for a purpose. And here's what Rashi says. Kol makom shenemar elu. Whenever you study the Torah, and something is preceded by the word Ela, these, Hasalat The word these is written to indicate that this and what follows is more important than what came before it. So if there are a series of laws or a series of lessons, a series of undertakings that the Torah describes before, these ordinances supersede them. Hasalat What comes now, whenever the word these is there, it's a word that obviously is stressing this collection, this message, this is a way of sort of pointing, ah, you want to know what's important? This is important. Eila mishpatim. These mishpatim. But it doesn't say this. It says ve'ela and these. And so Rashi tells us that while the rule is if it had only the letter, the word ela without the vav, the message would be what follows is more important than what came before. However, when it says the ela and the vav is the word and in English, mosif al harishonim. The word ve'ela means that what I'm about to teach you, you should connect and bind with that which came before. So eh, so the word ele chops up, separates one idea from the other, and what comes after ele is more important than the first. Ve'ele connects the two together and tries to create some sort of equivalency. And so Rashi explains a little bit more clearly what that equivalency is, and this is what he says. Maharishonim Misinai, just like the first set of laws emanated and their origin is in Sinai, af elu Misinai, so too what is about to follow also has its origin in Sinai. Meaning that last week's Parsha was Parsha Yitro with a dramatic revelation of the Jewish people standing around Har Sinai and throughout the, through the very descriptive and graphic uh, narrative in Parsha Yitro, we come to understand that God revealed himself to the Jewish people and declared in this very loud, as it were, revelation, the Ten Commandments. It's a mistake in translation, but Asirat Hadi brought the Ten Utterances, the Ten Sayings. Okay. And that clearly is from Sinai. That's the story. The word ve'ela is to tell us that just like all of the Aserah that he brought are unquestionably, unequivocally rooted in the Sinai revelation experience of last week's Parsha, everything in this week's Parsha is part of, that part of that experience. It's the same thing. It's as though there was no break in the parashot, and Yitro just went straight into this. Now, for purposes of division, we have obviously a new Parsha with a new name, and it begins with the word ve'ele, but the Torah wants us to understand, don't think that just because this is a new Parsha, and we read it in Shul one week later, that somehow there's a diminished connection between the significance of the Yitro moment of Asherah Hadibrot and the Mishpatim moment a week later. No. Just like everything in Yitro, the Asherah Hadibrot come from Sinai, so too do all the 43 mitzvot in Parashat and Mishpatim have the same origin. Okay. So, 
let's just stop a second and ask ourselves, <clears throat> what's the point here? We need to understand the reason behind God's insistence that it starts with Bela, and what Rashi's message is, and what are we supposed to take away from it. So, Rabbi Yisrael Isserloi lived between the years 1390 and 1460, when he died. And amongst the things that he wrote, he wrote a short collection of his Divri Torah on the Humash. He also wrote some very important halakhic works. They were called Trumata Deshen that are studied till this day. And his works carry a lot of halachic weight, and they, they are involved, they are used in deciding halachic issues. But he also had some things to say about the nature of Humashim and explain things. So I want to explain his perspective, his perspective on what that Vav is supposed to be teaching us. So what that Vav is supposed to be teaching us is the following. I explained to you that the nature of Mishpatim are laws that govern human social behavior and patterns of behavior in society. So all of Parsha and Mishpatim is lots and lots of aspects of civil law. If it, they, they form, as it were, the core verses on which so much of the Gemara is made, especially the, the section is now Daf Yomi, Baba Kama, in all sorts of aspects of civil law and civil damages and things like that. Okay. So, says Rav Yisrael Israelite, the reason that the Torah wanted to make sure that we, the readers, the learners, the studiers of Torah, understand of this unbreakable connection between the content of, say, of Parsha and Mishpatim and the scene at Sinai in Parsha Yitro is the following. Because once you read this, you can say to yourself, you know, truth be told, there probably were lots of societies in the world that also governed themselves with many of the similar laws that you found in Parsha and Mishpatim. You don't have to be Jewish to either conceive of or believe in some of the things that have to do in this Parsha. And when we read through the Parsha, you'll say, you know what, it's true. Those, those are things that make sense to a lot of cultures. Those are things that make sense to a lot of people throughout the world. And if we were to get on a plane and do a sort of anthropological anthropology, or we were to we study other cultures in a geography course, we probably would find that many societies also integrate and make use of some of the ideas in Parashat Mishpatim. So you might be led to believe that these are sort of like sensible laws. And in his words, these are laws which have our mitzvot sich liot. These are commandments which just make sense. Your sikhl tells you that this is the way to behave. And in fact, because one may think that these mitzvot are sefaldik, that they're logical and make sense, maybe they didn't come from God. Maybe the stuff that God wrote is the stuff that only God could come up with, the things that you and I would never conceive of, that really requires a divine mind to sort of think of and to promulgate. But the stuff that sort of Form the basis of social discourse and social society, maybe Moshe made it up. He was a smart guy, 100%. And maybe he actually wrote it. Maybe he's the author of some of, the, of this whole Parsha. Maybe Moshe was smart, articulate, and he wrote it out. So, says Rabbi Yisraeli, in order to make sure that you and I don't mistakenly think that because the content of Parsha Mishpatim may in fact make sense to us and may not seem to require divine origin, the Torah wants us to know that that's not the case. That these were in fact rooted in Sinai, just like Shabbos was rooted in Sinai. Just like any other mitzvah that would have only been able to be expressed through a divine decree came from Sinai, all of these came from Sinai. So just to peel that back one more layer to make sure that we're thinking about this, I think, in the correct way. What I think the Torah wants us to understand is, yes, the human mind is capable of establishing what seems to be its own moral code. That there could be something called natural morality. What's natural morality? Well, natural morality is the sense that you and I have. There's some things in life that seem right and some things in life seem wrong. 
And you don't have to be a religious person of any faith to have come to that conclusion. There's certain acts, terrible, tragic, evil crimes that you know in your kishkas, you know in your heart, you know in your sort of soul are not to be done, that they're wrong. So there's a possibility of us acknowledging the presence of some sort of natural morality in life. And that would not be untrue. But the Torah says that may be true, but it's not sufficient, meaning that while there may be the possibility of establishing the presence of natural morality, natural morality as a outgrowth of the human mind and human society does not bring with it the notion of an imperative, meaning what? you got to follow it. It's what people conceive of. And usually what people conceive of is often not associated with the notion of it must be done, it must be followed. A divine call seems to be of a higher authoritative voice and more likely to be obeyed than simply what a person says, you know, I thought about this a lot, and it seems to me that this is really the right way for all of us to behave. And natural morality, while it may seem convincing, often is not really consistent and persistent throughout human history. And perhaps no other people better than the Jews can testify to that, because there was a period of time where there was a sense of natural morality in many of the countries in Europe, and some of them who, in fact, might have been described as reaching the height of their own cultural and moral development, such as a.k.a. Germany. And yet, that particular nation was capable of the most heinous and unspeakable crimes possible. How could that be? What about natural morality? So the, the flaw or the deficit in natural morality is its ability to bind people and to make people feel that they, have, they must follow these laws. And so, Eila HaMishvatim begins by saying, no, not Eila, the Eila, that the reason that these laws are there is we want, Hashem wants us to understand that they are rooted in the same imperative as all the other mitzvot in the Torah. It's not because they make sense. It's not because they make us feel good. It's not because society needs them in order to govern itself socially, harmoniously. No, it's because Hashem told us we have to do it. And when Hashem speaks and says, you are obligated to fulfill this mitzvah. We are obligated to fulfill the mitzvah. Not because it's socially harmonious, but because it's God's divine command. That, my friends, is Rabbi Yisrael Israeline's explanation as to why Hashem felt it absolutely significant to buy Parsha Mishpatim the Sinai. Rabbi Yitzhak Huttner had a different take on the reason behind that. And he suggests the following. He suggests if you were to ask people, how, how, what makes you from? What makes you religious? What are the mitzvot that make you religious? Rabbi Huttner was concerned that for many people, wrongly, they may say, well, what makes you religious is the fulfillment of mitzvot. And the mitzvot that these people may rattle off or list for you are mitzvot that would typically fall into the categorical, the category called Ben Adam Makom, the mitzvot that represent or govern our relationship to God. Kosher, Shabbos, Shatnez, Mila, all of these things that somehow we would associate with the lifestyle of the from and famous. Says Rabbi Huttner, those mitzvot are important, but it's not the only thing that defines your from kite. What makes you from is your ability to do those mitzvot, but no less your ability to be as careful and as strict and as demanding of yourself when it comes to the other set of mitzvot, which are listed in Parashat Mishpatim. It's too easy to take a look at one big block of mitzvot in the Torah and say, oh, those are the mitzvot that define your religiosity. And all too often, Rabbi Gutner says, all too often, too many Jews, he's worried, would elevate the mitzvot that govern our relationship to God way, way higher than the mitzvot 
that govern our relationship to other people, our society, being Adam Lachabiro. And therefore, says Rav Kodner, that's why Hashem insisted on that vav, the Eila. He wants us to understand that everything in Parsha Mishvatim, all the 43 mitzvot, which governs so many different scenarios and cases that uh, that involve people and, and sometimes people's inappropriate behavior and damages and uh, whatever it is, those mitzvot are no less religious than the mitzvot that somehow are often seen as being, oh, you know, you're very careful on the food you eat and you're careful about Shabbos and you can't touch this and you can't do that. All of those mitzvot are 100% true, but they're not the only definition of what it is. And when you think about that, that, that combination of being the dumb Lachabi Ro and being the dumb Lamakom, of course, that's one of the classic divisions of the Aserah that they brought. All the mitzvot on the right side, the first five, are being a dumb Lamakom, with the last one on the right side, which is the one of honoring your parents, which is a transition. You think well, honoring your parents ought to be on the left side, which are the mitzvot that govern the way people treat each other. But because our parents in some ways are compared to God, and they have a certain sense of um, creative ability that God has bestowed upon them. So they really are sort of fit on the right and can move to the left. So because these Aserit Adibrut have a right side and a left side, being Dhamma Makom, being Dhamma Kaviro, we understand that God created those five on the right and those five on the left because together they form the core of our religious being. And as I said before, Rabbi Sajid Rohan says, in fact, the Aseret Hadibrut are not really ten individual specific commandments. It's a the wrong it's a wrong translation of the English the Ten Commandments. Sadi Run says that actually all of those Aseret Hadibrut are themselves titles of categories, ten categories, into which all the six hundred and thirteen mitzvot somehow collapse. So all the mitzvot, for example, that have anything to do with calendar observances, <clears throat> you put them all under the category of the Shabbat one, because those are mitzvot that have a specific timeline that have to be done, like Shabbat, the seventh day. So he says, if you go through all the 600, Ron, says if you go through all the 613 mitzvah, you can actually sort of sort them and say, oh, that's a mitzvah that would fall under this, and that's a mitzvah that would fall under that. Perfect. So if we see the wholeness, the sort of gestalt, the interconnectedness of all these mitzvah, it occurred to me when I was preparing tonight's share that something interesting happens um, in Parshat Bo, as the Jewish people in Mitzrayim are preparing for their first Pesach experience. And in three separate psukim in Parshat Bo, and in one pasuk later on in the Mashtarim, Hashem projects a moment in time in which children are going to go to their parents to begin conversations about that momentous moment in time called Yitziat Mitzrayim. And those four verses that depict these sorts of conversations and back and forth between parents and kids about Yitziat Mitzrayim, as you know, become ultimately the source for what part of the Haggadah? The Arba Bani, the four sons. And so it wasn't just a random selection of four sons or four children. Those four, that part of the Haggadah was a reflection of four specific psukim that talk about Yitziat Mitzrayim as the subject of some sort of conversation, discussion, learning moment between parents and children. But it occurred to me something interesting. Clearly, Yitziat Mitzrayim is a transformative moment in the Jewish people's lives. No question about it. It is the birth of the Jewish people. Yes, Yaakov and the entire Jewish people are in Mitzrayim, but they were there as a series of families that grew and grew and grew and grew and grew and grew. It's not to say for Shmot, that something happens and the Jewish people become the people, become B'nai Israel, they become a nation. Um, and as they left Mitzrayim, it was like the birth of the nation. It was a critical step towards nationhood. And so it makes sense for the Torah to say there may be moments in time in the future where children are going to be curious about this and they may ask you some very, very difficult questions. Some of the questions may be very challenging. You may think that they're trying to attack. Some of the questions may be so wise and insightful. Some of the questions may be just simple. They're looking for some information. And some of the kids may not even be able to formulate what it is that's bothering them, and you may need to step in. And so, of course, as I said a second ago, there you have the Arbor Bunyan episode. But I wonder, that was only one of two moments in the time the Jewish people were in the desert, which were so transformational. That was number one. What was the second event? Well, that was last week's Parsha, Arsenite, right? 
That moment changed the Jewish people. It gave us the Torah. It gave us the Israel that we brought. It gave us purpose. It gave us direction. It gave us meaning to life. To take the Jewish people out of Mitzrayim trying to walk into the desert without any destination was not an act of liberation. Liberation can only end if life is given meaning, and that meaning is the giving of the Torah. So that's why, for example, when you know <clears throat> every Jewish holiday has a date in the Torah, every Jewish holiday except one. What is the one that does not have a date? Shavuos. So how do you know when Shavuos is? And the Torah says, well, here's the system. At least it was a biblical system. Now we can rely on calendars. But in its original formulation, the way in which you know when Shavuos is, is you... You count. Torah tells you count 50 days from the second day of Pesach all the way. And then on that 50th day, you're going to celebrate a holiday called Shavuos. Why? Because that's the day following the exodus from Egypt that God revealed himself to the Jewish people. Meaning that you have to link Pesach and Shavuos. They can't be seen as independent days. The link is, is that physical liberation, which is represented by the exodus, Pesach, can only be considered complete and final and whole when followed by the purpose in life, which is Matan Torah. So having said that, and having established the centrality of Matan Torah, and the centrality of that event around Har Sinai that's described in last week's parsha, it occurred to me, why does the Torah never say, and when your children ask you questions about that moment in time? There are no psukim which talk about parents and kids having conversations about Matan Torah. There are four psukim about children wanting to know about Yitzhak Mitzrayim. But there's no psukim that talk about children wanting to know about Matan Torah. And I wondered, why is that? If both are critical to the life of the Jewish people, both are transformational to the growth of the Jewish people, both are central and primary because they bring something that cannot be ignored or certainly can't be eliminated from our, not only our national psyche, but who we are as a people, then why do you only have this idea And when your kids ask you and challenge you and question you or don't even say anything, then you as a parent, you have to, you have to be. Why is there nothing about Matan Torah? Never thought about it until this year, actually. And I wonder whether or not the answer to that is what we've been leading up to. Matan Torah is not an event. Matan Torah is a constant in our lives. And in fact, some of the Chachamim say it's sort of renewed each and every day. It's, there, there, there's a Midrash that says each and every day the same voice that they heard around Har Sinai emanates from the heavens declaring Torah again and again. But the point is, is that whereas you'd see at Mitzrayim was a moment in time, it was a historical event. And we recreate it each and every year on the 15th day of Nisan. We have a ritual, we have a Seder, we have Pesach, Mohammed, turn over the kitchen, yada, 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 whatever it is. We don't have anything like that for Shavuos. And the reason is, is because every day is given the Torah. Every day represents an integration of the messages of the Torah in our everyday life. The entire Parsha of Mishpatim is, in fact, yet another declaration of God's presence in society. And so, whereas it would have said, it might have made sense for kids to turn to their parents, you know, how come we're, we're throwing up the bagels? Well, I want to have a bagel. No, I can't have only matzah. It made sense because the nature of our observance of Pesach, the nature of our integration of Torah should be so seamless, should be so constant, should be so regular that the kids are not going to ask questions. They're not going to point and say, oh, manish tana laila zeh, because there is no manish tana laila zeh. It's like this every night. Abba, mommy, dad, we're, we're always doing this. We should be always talking about Torah. We should always be putting on, you know, our tefillin during the week. We're always benching. We're always, whatever it is. And so the centrality of Torah is so critical that it obviated the need to have that sort of presence in a ritual that made more sense for Pesach. But having said that, having said that, then I want to transition into Parshat Mishpatim just a little bit more as our first topic. So after we talk about the centrality of Torah, after we talk about how we lead up to it, after we talk about Ve'ela and Eva, we get to the very first topic. And I don't know about you, but I'm expecting something huge, right? I'm expecting, oh my gosh, the Torah, where this first Rashi is telling us Ve'ela is connecting Sinai to, to Parsha Mishpatim. So I know what the Aseret have been brought up. So do you. And they're big, they're huge they're categories. They're so transformational. And so I would expect that Parsha Mishpatim somehow is going to open up with something so foundational, something so critical to the life of the Jewish people. And what is that? 
What's the first thing that the Torah tells us in Parsha Mishpatim? It talks about Jewish slaves. Wow, Jewish slaves. Like, what is that? Like, why? Why don't we talk about something that comes up with oh, lending money? Oh, lending money. Some of the rules about lending money. That's pretty common. Can you imagine if society didn't have people who were willing to lend to each other and what would happen then and now? That would be critical. Let's start with that. It's in the Parsha, but we don't start with that. Why not? Why don't we talk about that? We start with something that, number one, for us in the, where we are today, 2024, the idea of talking about Jewish slaves doesn't, I, I, I'm assuming it doesn't resonate with everybody on this tonight. Like, I don't have a slave. You, I'm assuming you don't have slaves. Yes, we were slaves historically. Okay, I understand that. We talked about that. But now we're setting up the whole notion of civil society. So why begin with a slave? Why talk about that? So let me try and, uh, and respond with two possible answers. Answer number one. When you take a look at last week's Parsha, and we understand what the, the there's the specific detailed messages we serve that we brought, I understand that. But beyond that, what was the foundational message that Hashem was trying to convey to the Jewish people by revealing the Assyria of Yitro? What lies is at core? What lies at its core is God's faith that he believes in us, that he wants us to bring meaning to our lives in a guided fashion, in an informed fashion, in an elevated fashion. You don't give me mitzvot to people who are incapable of reaching that level. You don't. That's cruel. It's cruel. You don't hobble people on purpose and to show them, ha, you're incapable, you're incompetent. I thought you could, but you can't. God isn't like that. And we spoke about that last week. When we talked about Mode'ani. Hashem has faith in us. Hashem does believe that we can reach these levels. So that was a Sarah that we brought. Hashem giving us, as it were, the guidance <laughs> excuse me, to create within ourselves a holiness that will animate us, our families, and our society. Okay, that's great. But if God believes that, if that's the core, then it might make a little bit more sense for us to begin with this topic of Jewish slaves. Now, how did a person become a Jewish slave? Historically. I don't mean owned by a, a, a non-Jewish oppressor and invading army. That we know. That's a story of history. But why would a Jew own another Jew? How did that come to be? That seems like an anathema. We were slaves to other people. Why do we want to own slaves? That's not what we should be doing. So a couple of thoughts. So number one, how did a person become a Jewish slave? A person became a Jewish slave because they may have either stolen money or, and, and now don't have the money to return it, number one. Or, and they, therefore, because they stole money and they're obligated to return it, that's the halachic rule. You have to pay back what you stole plus pay a penalty. You have to pay twice the value of what you stole. The person doesn't have it. So they don't get off scot-free. So halachically, there was this institution called Evid Ivri, where the bait team sold the person, and in selling the person, money would be returned to the victim of the crime. And the Evid would work for six years for a Jewish master uh, until the six years were over, and then he would go free on the seventh. Okay, that's the first idea, or that's the first way in which a person became a slave. The second way in which a person became a slave is if um, not they stole money, but they borrowed money and they couldn't pay it back. So everything was an upfront transaction. There was not, nothing illegal here, but Nebuch, the person, could not pay back the loan. But he has to pay back the loan because somebody was kind enough to, to give him money. So he can't just turn back and say, sorry, and you're out of your money, you gave me $10,000. I don't have it, so you lose enough. That doesn't work that way. So how does the loan get paid back? Again, if he can't pay back the loan, he would be sold into slavery by the big team. And the money would go back to pay back the loan, and he would work for six years. Okay. So it doesn't seem like it's a, certainly not a romantic, it's not a particularly engaging topic to begin this whole notion of the team. But here are a couple of thoughts that I want you to think about in terms of what may underlie this whole social institution called Evidy Brief. 
Number one, if a person reaches a point where he commits some of these crimes, he needs to be quote unquote rehabilitated. So I know in the modern world, we put them in prison. We can question the rehabilitative impact that prison has on somebody who's in prison. That's a big question. There's a lot of studies about that. But that's not the Torah way. The Torah way is put them with a family. Let them be, live for six years with a family. Let them live with the family. And let them watch for six years how a husband treats his wife. And let them watch how parents raise a child or many children. Let them watch how people do business. Let them watch and pay attention to how you create positive relationships. That's a rehabilitative framework. And what's at the core of rehabilitation? The conceptual core is you can grow. You can get over this. You can be better tomorrow than you are today, which is exactly the message of Asera to be brought. That was what the message at Sinai was. You can be better tomorrow than you are today if you follow God's wisdom. God's mitzvah, God's Torah. And so perhaps the idea that the notion of what's at the core of a serah to be brought should be at the core of the beginning of Parshat Mishpatim makes somewhat a little bit more sense. That it's not like this wacko, crazy, left-field topic that really has no connection to life. On the contrary, what lies at the connection is the deep-seated belief that a person can change. And we are guiding that change through a framework and not looking, in fact, to punish. And when you take a look at the Gemara and all the laws that were connected to slavery, you'll realize, oh my gosh, that the, the master who bought the slave has bought, taken upon himself so many restrictions about what he can or can't do that it's not a simple thing. You may be thinking of movies that you saw, you know, of how black slavery, how blacks were treated in slavery in the United States. It's nothing like that. Nothing like that at all. The Torah is very demanding how the Jewish slave owner is to treat his Jewish slave. That's one possibility. And the other possibility is simply that, you know, living as a slave, while it might have been rehabilitated, was not God's idea of who you should be. And if you willingly sold yourself into slavery because of a financial issue, I get it. But if you willingly sold yourself into slavery because you were looking to sort of absolve yourself of accountability and personal responsibility, that's a serious mistake. What lies at the heart of the religious personality is a willing embrace of the notion of personal accountability and responsibility. And that's what lies at the basis of all of Parashat Mishpatim and truthfully, the basis of all mitzvot. Somebody who is not accountable and not responsible cannot be expected to do a mitzvah. And the Torah wants to start with Evan Ivri, not as an example of what you should aspire to, but as an example of what you should not be looking at. And if you want to see a, a picture of a lifestyle that is not what I want you to follow, that's what it is. And sometimes you need to see the starkness of what Hashem says, that's not what I want you to be, in order to better understand and embrace the path that Hashem does want us to follow. And so that may be, in fact, one of the ideas of why the Torah began Parshat Mishpatim with the notion of everyday three. We're connecting ourselves to Sinai. We're connecting ourselves to the authority of Sinai and all of these things. We're also connecting ourselves, I think, conceptually to the framework of what lies at the uh, heart of the Sinaitic expression. I want to move a little to um, to uh, in, in Parakapalot, and I want to go to Pasu Yutet 19. I want to read it for you. You can follow along. Pasu Yutet. No, let me start again with 18. I think there's a, that gives you the context. If men quarrel and one strikes his fellow with a stone or with a fist and he does not die, the, the uh, victim does not die from the blow, but falls into bed, so he's injured and he, he can't function the way he normally did, he needs to now recuperate, re to convalesce. If he gets up and goes about outside under his own power, the one who struck is absolved. So meaning, if he can function, then he hasn't really been injured, and the person who hit him uh, cannot be held responsible because he's, there was no damage, there was no physical injury. 
only for his lost time shall he pay, and he shall provide for healing. So there are limits to what the person can claim damages to. If you can work, that's one thing. If you can't work, then there's an unemployment insurance, as it were, that the person has to pay for. But listen to the following. I want to read this part again. Only for his lost time shall he pay. And the last words, and he shall provide for healing. And he shall provide for healing. So, after reading the words, and looking at the context of an injury inflicted by a person, and then there may be a need for some uh, medical intervention and healing. The Gemara Masechet Brachot says, and from this idea where the Torah says, Verapo Yerape, from here we learn, Shinitam Rashut Lerafei Lerapot. Here we learn that Hashem has given permission to doctors to heal. Now, what's the point? The point is, of course, that ultimately our lives are in God's hands. So maybe you might have thought, since God gives us our lives, and he's the ultimate healer, that anybody who uh, needs healing should not seek any medical intervention. Why? Because that's not what God wants. God should be the only healer allowed to heal anybody. If you're not well, that's a sign of divine will, and you should not circumvent divine will, so there should be no role for doctors. But the fact that it says, in a positive sense, would indicate that, no, that's not the case. There is a divine interest in people helping each other heal. And therefore, from here, it will see that God has given permission for the doctor to heal. Okay, so let's just talk a little bit about this notion of healing as it applies. Now, doctors, healing. So all of us, we get that. Maybe some of us have had to go to doctors in our lives, and maybe some of us have needed doctors to really help heal us from a serious illness or somebody who we love, or well, we know about what goes on in the world. We're not hiding underneath the rock. Doctors heal people who are very ill. I get that. So that makes sense. That's sort of like part of the natural order of the universe. There are things like illness. There are things that um, happen. There, there are things that for which if we didn't have medical intervention, God forbid, the consequences would be very serious. And maybe it's necessary for us to remember that when doctors do what they do, really they're acting as God, as shlichim, as agents of God. We should not confuse the doctor as being healing. So if you're going to a doctor, you're going to a surgeon, you know, thank God they were able to get it out and they, these doctors are made amazing doctors, gold in the hand. They were amazing hands. They were so successful. We need to remember that as successful as the doctors are, they're only successful because Hashem wants them to be successful. God, everybody can understand that. But the case in which your Rapo Yerape is mentioned here is not that case. It's not the case of somebody who would fall in bed because they were ill. That's not the case. The case is, as the Torah describes it, two people are getting into a fight. Get into a fist fight, and when he slugs somebody else and hurts him seriously, wait a minute. So that's different, isn't it? Isn't that different? Like when a person, God forbid, you hear a diagnosis, somebody go ill with whatever it is. Rahman Ali slugged terrible, terrible. Now, when two people get into a fight, you know, somebody smashes the other person with their fist, you know broke their tooth, broke their bone, broke their arm, whatever it is, busted their glasses. How would you relate to that? What would be your reaction? Would you have the same reaction if you were told, huh, oh, you know, it's got sick, you got, oh my gosh, it's sudden diagnosis. Would you feel the same way or somehow our reaction would be different? Chances are our reaction would be different. So maybe what the Torah is telling us, and I think this is a bit of a provocative idea, is that the following. You might think that the first case is one in which makes sense. The second case, it's like, you guys did the wrong thing. You made stupid decisions. You got ego, and anger, passion, and that's what you did. So really, 
it wasn't God that brought this upon you, it was you who brought it upon yourself. So the Chafetz Chaim, in, um, in his commentary to the Torah, it says, well, I think this is the wrong here comment. He says, that's exactly the point. Do you believe that there's meaningfulness in the things that happen to us? Do you think that? Do you think things happen randomly? Or do you think that there's some sort of divine finger involved? In this? Not with illness, but other stuff. Do you think that what happens to us in life is coincidence, meaninglessness, randomness, or do you think that there are things that happen to us for a reason? So if I got into a light, is that random or is it not? Is what happened to me or to the other person that I was fighting with because of our anger? Is it simply the result my poor judgment entirely, or his or her poor judgment entirely, devoid of any role that God played. And the Chafetz Chaim says, no, of course not. He believes that that's part of the way in which God sort of has his finger in some of the elements of our lives. The Torah comes to teach us, maintains the Chafetz Chaim, that even that fight somehow emanated from Shemun. That's a difficult concept. I think it's a difficult concept. We don't normally think that way, unless we're willing to sort of make the following statement. You know, when um, when God forbid you have to go to a Shiva house, we know that before we leave, when we go to Shiva house, it's the midst of Nikhil Mavedin. But before we leave, you probably know what's the classical line we say to the Avel before we leave. The classical line is Hamakom Yenachem Etchem Yitoch Sha'ar Avilei Tzion Yerushalayim. Translated in English, it's God shall may God comfort you amongst the other one of Zion Jews. The word for God is Hamakom. Now, literally in Hebrew, Hamakom doesn't mean God. It means the place. And in fact, nowhere in Tanakh is the name of God Ever it is Makom ever used as the name of God? Hashem, Kael, Shakai. There's seven different names, Elohim, but never is the name Makom written in the Tanakh as the name of God. And so, why is it that our Chachamim Zuchanami without blessed memory, when they taught us what to say to an Avil when we take leave of the Avil, why did they use the word Makom, place, for this type of name for God? So, one of the answers is more than one. I'm going to share one with you, which is connected to the point that I think the Chachamim is making. The word Makom means place. So why would we call God as the place? Because the answer is, God is the place. There is no place other than God. Or, to say it differently, there is no place that God is not present. That everywhere you go, God's presence is. So why is that a sense of comfort? Why is that a good thing to say to the other? Because the point that we're making when we say, Hamakom yinachim, that may God, Hamakom, the place comfort you, that whatever happens to us is not random. Whatever happens to us is not meaningless. Because wherever we are, wherever we are, in whatever situation we find ourselves, God is there. If God was not a Makom, if God was not in that place, then it could, could be all meaningless. That if I ever got into a fight, like, what, what happened? Nothing, you know, bad, bad, bad luck. Jews don't believe in bad luck. That's not the way we see ourselves in the world. There is a divine presence in our lives. Not just at the time of death. I think that's the most blatant time. We're most likely to ask those questions, right? Oh my God, why did this happen? Why did this happen? Well, I don't know the answer to the why it happened. But when we say to the other, we're not just saying it to the other. We're also saying it to ourselves. When we hear our ears hear the words come out of our mouth. Now, what we're saying is, there is no such thing as rent. There is no such thing as meaninglessness. And even though you don't understand the reason why somebody whom you love so much was taken away from this world, it had a meaning. And in some ways, that's comforting. To think that there is no meaning, that's difficult. That's hard to swallow. That's hard to live by. That's what the Chavetz Chaim is saying. Is as difficult as it may be to sort of swallow this pill, what he's saying is stuff happens to us for a reason. It doesn't happen just by chance that there may be an illness. I get a chas v'shalom. 
but there could also be some sort of divine message in the fact that I got involved in a fight and somebody got injured. Oh, that's just my stupid decision-making process. That's not a sham. No, it's somehow related. My job is to peel back the layers to figure out how, what's the message to me? And we diamond if that were to happen to me. And that sort of level of introspection, that level, that level of questioning as to why the thing has happened, says the Chafetz Chaim, is what it means to be a conscious and thinking Jew. Because to do anything else is to limit the presence of God in our lives. And that, says the Chafetz Chaim, doesn't bring us a greater sense of joy or comfort. In fact, it may take us in the opposite direction. Okay. A little later on in Parshat Mishpatim, and I'm going to jump now to Parak Chav Gimel 23, the Torah states the following. And again, the, the example that the Torah gives us may be example more common in a rural agrarian society, which was typical in the time that the Torah was written. But we don't have to be geniuses to figure out and see how it in fact can be up, updated and upgraded to modern times. So here's the Pasuk. It's chapter 23, Pasuk Gimel. Um, excuse me, Pasuk K, not Gimel. Ki tir ech amor son acha rovetz tachad masao v'chadalta me azov lo, azov tazovi. If you see the donkey of someone you hate crouching under its burden, would you refrain from helping him? You shall help repeatedly with him. So let's just go back to the case. You're walking along. This is, again, in the time of the Torah. And you see somebody whom you hate. So you're not having a good relationship with this person. This is a person that you don't get along with. Something happens in a lot of history, you're fine. And this person has a donkey. But the donkey of this person has got so many boxes, so many peckle upon it, that it and it, it can't get up. It can't get up. It's lying on the ground, and it's too. It's not either packed properly, the way it's distributed properly, and the animal can't get up. So Torah says, "Would you refrain from helping the Hadalta me azovla? No, you shall help repeatedly with him. Azov tazovim. It's the person you hate, right? It's not a person you like, but the person you like has an animal, and this animal is in distress, and so." Would you just walk away and say, I, I hate that guy, let that at him? No, you, you can't. Now, interestingly enough, this is one of the few places in the Torah where, that the way in which the Torah expresses itself is through a rhetorical question. So here we have a context of a mitzvah, what you should do. And the Torah says, would you really walk away? That's an unusual perspective. Respect, that's an unusual way of the Torah describing itself and talking. You see this happening? Would you walk away? And so, ha, of course not. You know better. So in that style itself is something worthy of just pausing and reflecting. So the Torah is writing in a way that almost makes it self-evident that to see somebody, even somebody you don't like, um, in a state of distress or his animals in a state of distress, we are created in God's image, and it's unlikely that the Torah, that we created in God's image would just walk away. That's counter to who we are. That's against our DNA. Would you possibly think of walking away? It's like the Torah is asking a question that everybody reading is thinking to themselves, of course not. Of course not. It's like just push it. It's obvious. That's not the way we conduct ourselves. So it's almost as though the Torah is saying, Built into who we are is this thread or DNA thread of compassion. And I've mentioned before in other Shirin that the Gemara says that, you know, one of the ways in which we can judge a person's genealogy, and you have a right to question whether the person's really, really Jewish, is if they don't display the characteristics which the Gemara says are typical of Jews, which are we show humility, we show compassion. We, we, we do that. We show kesed. We are Baishanim, we are Gomle Chasadim, we are Rachmanim, and if you see somebody who you thought was Jewish behaving in a way which is totally void of humility, totally void of compassion, totally void of chesed, you have a right to say, you know what, somewhere along the line, something doesn't fit. There, there's some, the, somebody, somebody didn't come from Jews. Somebody was standing at Har Sinai and didn't hear the Be'ela Mishpatim part. That, that can't be. 
Because for us, it's as binding as any other mitzvah. And for you to walk away, that's that's not the way in which we were built. In fact, there's an interesting story. And maybe it's a story of um, unusual piety. I don't know whether many people, I'm even not sure that halakhically it's necessary, but just listen to the story. Um, the the uh, Mashgiach of Yeshiva Lomje before the war of uh, Moshe Rosenstein. Um, when he was younger, participated in his family's business, which was to um, run a pharmacy, such as it was. And after a certain while, he left in order to study in yeshiva, and the rest of his family took care of the business. And he would come back from time to time to sort of help out with the, with the business. But he had spent most of his time in yeshiva. Um, at some point, he became the primary person responsible for the store, and he closed the pharmacy, closed the pharmacy, and started another business. Not another pharmacy, but another business. And somebody asked him, you know, you had a pharmacy. It seemed to be a, uh, a successful business. So why did you close it? And so this was his answer to the question. He says, On the one hand, pharmacies are, are good stores. Why are they good? Because what do they do? They dispense medicine to people who need it. And so on one hand, he said, I could see why my business could be interpreted as a business that uh, provides compassion to those who need it. Um, but on the other hand, he said, it could also lead to my becoming a more cruel personality of an individual. Why? Because who doesn't want their business to succeed? And in order for my business to succeed, and I'm governing for a sham, we all ought to be governing to a sham for our purpose. So what am I governing to a sham for? A sham may my business succeed. So in order for my business to succeed, you need to get sick. Because that's what pharmacies do. Pharmacies sell medicine. That's what it did. Not like Shoppers Drug Mart now. And you can go to the corner and you can get apples and milk and who knows what else. But then pharmacies actually sold medicine. And that was it. That was all they did. So for my pharmacy to be successful, I need to be dumbing to a shem that there are going to be a lot of sick people, sick people lining up and going to the doctor and coming to me with scripts. And I should be doing this. He says, I can't do that. Because it's a, for me, that's not the way we should be doing. He says... That's the that's the point of this puzzle. Who would have thought possible that you see a situation of distress and you walk away? Of course not. So based on this pasuk, he said, what am I going to be going around davening to Hashem every day that he creates situations where people get sick? So the idea, the, the fourth in this pasuk, obviously, is to what extent do we integrate into our personalities this notion of being that compassionate? And we live in a time, honestly, where it's it's hard. It's sometimes hard. Because so many of the things that we see, our kids see, are images of just the opposite. Our death, of killing, of shooting, of swearing, of stealing, of figuring out how to get around things. Like, it, I, I, I know that there are studies that don't necessarily believe that the long exposure to television somehow affects children behavior. I'm not a proponent of that theory. Um, watching and seeing kids grow up with access to social media and know just how powerful a tool it is. So you can just imagine which message is getting through more profoundly, more consistently, and more powerfully to our kids. Is it the message of you can't possibly walk away from somebody who needs your help or you give it to them good? You know, make my day. You give it to them good. And I think that that's, it's a challenge in our society that this message be the message that we uh, we share. And I'm going to end with one last word. Continuing in Parak Kalbeik, I'm going to jump to Pasuk. Uh, actually, I'm not going to jump. I think I'm going to go one back. That was Pasuk Kalbeik. I'm going to, I'm going to jump to Parak Kalbeik to Pasuk Kalbeik. Here's the Pasuk. When you lend money to my people, to the poor person who is with you, 
no shed. Do not act toward him as a creditor. Do not lay interest upon him. So people need to borrow money. We know that. We know that sometimes people need money. We get it. So you can't charge interest. So the Kotzke Rebbe, the great Kotzke Rebbe. Now, again, remember that the, the, Hasidic, the Hasidic Rebbe, Rebbe, were looking at every word, every person, and trying to extract not just the halakhic message, but the moral message. For Hasidim, often, the message was the refinement of character, the neshama, a little bit more than what they saw to be the cold intellectual traditions of the yeshivish Lithuanian community. Hasidim tried to sort of elevate the neshama of every Jew. Not always through intellectual analysis of the Talmud, but through messages of encouragement uh, and that everybody has a neshama that can be purified and elevated. And so, one more time, I want to read this pursuit. Im kesef halve et ami. When you lend money to my people. Now, the word talve in Hebrew, in this context, is lend. But the same letters, if you just read it a little bit different, instead of talve, but tilave, it's just a slight change in one of the vowels. Then til, talve means then, tilave means escort, to accompany. Well, what does that mean? In kesef, tilave et am. So the Kotzke Rebbe is saying the following. You're never going to take your money with you. Nobody can. The wealthiest person at one point in their life will no longer be alive. And no matter how much money they accumulate, it won't prevent them from dying. And they don't take their money with them. They won't. You can't take your money with you. But to love it in Kesev, if, in fact, you do give your money to the Ani, then your kesef will accompany you, not the money, but the merit of your money. The merit of what you've done with it, that the fact that you helped other people, that zechut will accompany you. You can't take it with you, but it can be a zechut for you. I want to end with an amazing story. In the year 2016 in Miami Beach, Florida, there was a doctor by the name of Joel Dennis who passed away. Dr. Joel Dennis was instrumental in the establishment of the Hillel Day School in Miami, as well as the Shari Tfil Synagogue in Miami. And uh, he really loved his school, Hillel Academy, very, very much. In one year of three million years, they were struggling to find a head of school. They couldn't find a person, for whatever reason. It's not always easy. And so Dr. he was an orthopedic surgeon. And Dr. Dennis decided he was going to step in that one year to be the head of school. Really, he stopped his practice. He took over. He was very successful at his practice. For Hashem, he had a family, big family, very respected. And he took over as the head of school to help the school. He knew he wasn't an educator, but he was a smart guy, a reasonable guy, a phone guy. He wanted to help the school. As his year came to a conclusion at a dinner honoring him, the president. Oh, and he said, he took over the school. He said, I don't want you to pay me. I just want you to give me one dollar. That's it. One dollar for the job he did. At the dinner, in his tribute at the end of that one year, the president gave, um, gave him $10 and said, here's a 1,000% increase in your salary. So he gave him a $10 bill. Okay. Fast forward. Fast forward years. Seven, I think it was like maybe 17 years forward. And the year is now Friday, June 14, 2016. Dr. Dennis passes away from that fight. The shul secretary, the shul secretary went to one of the coffee stores to buy a cup of coffee in Miami Beach. And she paid and she got change. And she put the money in her wallet. Or she put the money actually in her car. Before Shava, she wanted to make sure there's no money lying around. So she grabbed the money, it was in the car, brought it in the house. And she noticed that the money she got from the coffee store at Bunkson was a $10 bill. And she looked at the $10 bill, and it was the same $10 bill that the president of the school gave Dr. Joel Dennis with the message on it. Now, 
This was 17 years after he got the bill as he did. So, like, again, if we believe that nothing is sort of coincidental, imagine that. He put his heart, his soul into a school that he helped create. He took a year off. He gave himself to the school. He gets as a thank you a ten dollar bill, and on the day he's lifted, on the day where people came to eulogize him, on the day that people came to give cover to whatever he did, the secretary of the school of the shul that he helped start gets the same ten dollar bill that he got as a sign of what to talk for what he did. You can't take it with you. Ki mo bemoto We know you cannot take it with you, but. If you lend it, if you give it away, if you have it in your heart, how you can help other people, that schut till a bit will accompany you forever and ever in this world and the next. Thank you, everybody, for joining us for our share tonight. Uh, please feel free to unmute yourselves. And so I'm happy to hear people's reactions. What a finale. Thank, thanks, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. It's unbelievable. I... The truth is the strangest fiction, right? Uh, oh, that that is for oh, sure yeah. true. That is for sure true. Whew. Thank you, I so much. Thank you, Baba. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Oh, Rose, you? oh my goodness, Arthur Rossi is on the line. And nice to see you. Eva, good to see you too. You're welcome, Jonathan. Thank you for joining. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Thank you, Rochelle, for joining. <laughs> Thank you, Rabbi. You're great. Thank you. Uh, you know, yeah. Thank you. You're beautiful. Yeah. Thank you, Ruth. Ra Thank you. Rabbi, can I, can I ask? Everybody have a wonderful way. Hi, Marty. Say hi to Sharon, too. Hi, I Marty. will. And uh, God willing, we'll see everybody next Tuesday. God, we, let's hope that there will be good news for, for hostages, for soldiers. For Jews in Israel, for the Jewish people throughout the world, let's hope. Amen. 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 Amen.